I do want to try putting on setting this in the slide. You, you want to do what? And do you want to try putting on the slides? Just so yeah, I, yeah, I can, I can put on the slides. Um, let's see. Do I go ahead and start one? Uh, let, give me a second, I'll introduce you. Um, okay. okay. Uh, the the title is a little. The title oh, is a yeah. little different than. Uh, yeah. I think I sent you the wrong title, but th yeah. this is uh, basically the same paper. It's a little different, but oh. it's basically. Well, actually, I found the other paper on the in the. Uh, oh right, the, yeah. Th this is a, a piece of that larger paper, which I think we re we realized was too long, so we we pulled out the the results we felt like we understood the best and are making that the main paper nice okay buenos dias a todos día de hoy estamos con scott cunningham scott es profesor de economía en la universidad de baylor y es un autor muy relevante en temas de economía aplicada y en temas de salud políticas de drogas y abusiones y acaba de publicar el IP que es un libro de referencia causal bastante bueno está en línea y está en físico por Amazon es un libro bastante accesible tiene todos los materiales de caso es súper interesante para trabajar Scott thank you for being here and you may go ahead no, thank you for having me, Juan. Do you want me to go ahead and start? Yes, please. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, having me. Uh, this is a paper with two PhD students at Baylor, uh, Vivian Vigliotti and Jonathan Seward. Uh, we've randomized the order of our names. Uh, the name of the paper is Indigent Defense, which I'll explain what these mean, uh, Indigent Defense social workers and suicide attempts in jail, evidence from randomized therapists. So in the United States, there is a growing, uh, there has been a growing movement uh, to try to address the uh, overuse of incarceration and the overuse of policing. And it's been trying to do that through various reforms Um, trying to do this through various reforms. Uh, and one of those reforms is the, uh, our diversion courts. And diversion courts uh, shift defendants um, out of our traditional court system into a secondary court, which usually isn't as uh, antagonistic. So the, the judge isn't necessarily trying to punish the defendant. One of those uh, is called the mental health court, and it's a diversion court for mentally ill defendants. These are people with things like depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and uh, their mental illness somehow contributed to their crime. They've become very popular in the United States. Uh, I only have data through 2016 uh, for the prevalence, but it was rising steadily up until 2016 to. Uh, over 600 U.S. counties had one of these courts. And it's, it's viewed as a viable alternative to incarceration, which um, in light of police reform movements in the United States, as well as the priorities, uh, the policy priorities of our new president, it's possible that something like mental health courts could start getting more attention. But the, the project is only indirectly about the mental health court system. In the United States, our constitution requires that poor clients or what's called indigent clients, the constitution requires that they get a lawyer who defends them in court if they can't afford one. But in this county in Texas called Travis County, they can either get a public attorney or a private attorney. And so the paper is going to be looking at the effect of getting assigned a public 
defense attorney compared to a private defense attorney in the mental health courts. And so these are mentally ill people that are gonna be represented by different kinds of lawyers. So it's the first, so the original contributions, I was trying to think about, you know, what do we, what do we think is original about the paper? The, the paper overall seems to be, uh, there's not a very large literature that this really fits into for economics. So, but here's a few things. I, I haven't seen another paper in economics that studies the mental health court system. It's usually psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, so it's the first paper to evaluate uh, some of the elements of the mental health court using instrumental variables because the mental health courts in the United States are very, very different county to county. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be able to take one common element of the mental health courts and evaluate it, this uh, presence of social workers. Um, so we're going to be using instrumental variables. We're one of only a couple of papers that try to evaluate whether or not public defense attorneys actually perform differently than the private defense attorneys. Um, so we're only a few papers that do that. And I think we're the first one to ever do it for the mental health court. I can't find anybody that's asking those questions within the mental health court. We're the first paper to use randomized therapists as an IV. I think I can't find anybody is, and we're the. I think we might be actually one of the first papers to to present evidence that social workers can reduce suicides, uh, even within the field of social work. It appears that it's a neglected topic. So here's what we find: if you're randomly assigned a public defender. Uh, relative to a private defender, there's no impact on committing another offense. So, you know, the, once you're in the mental health court, it doesn't really matter whether you get a public defender or a private defender from the perspective of committing another offense. They're really the same. But if you're assigned a public defender, there's real mental health score, mental health gains that we've documented First is we show that when you're randomly assigned a mental health, uh, a public defender, uh, relative to a private defender, your mental health score uh, on a two point scale falls a full point. So it looks like the, the people that went and were assigned a public defender, uh, they experienced improvements in their mental health uh, conditional on returning to the jail. But probably the most striking result was if you are assigned to a public defender, you're 12 to 16% less likely to attempt suicide and you're one to 2% less likely to, to reveal that you're thinking about suicide or that you're planning it. Uh, we think the most likely explanation after talking to the people in Travis County and being told that there really is no difference between the public and the private attorneys, except that the public attorneys employ a large number of social workers. Uh, we think that the reason for the decline in suicide attempts is because of the random assignment of social workers to the case. Um, suicide results are most precise for those uh, who do not have a prior offense. We do find negative effects, but they're more precise for the no prior offense group. So let me tell you about the mental health courts. So uh, jails and prisons in the United States have, they house a large number of mentally ill people in the United States. Uh, they're about 12 times more likely to have them. Inmates in a jail or a prison are about 12 times more likely to have a mental illness than a random person in the community. Uh, in most states, the jail uh, or the prison will house more mentally ill people than the largest psychiatric hospital in the entire state. In our data, 20% of the people in our data need, which is inmates in a jail, uh, they need treatment uh, on a, in, a, in, a, on a, in a given day for their mental illness. Um, there's also really high uh, incidence of mental illness amongst inmates that attempt suicide. 
Um, so any given day, 7% are experiencing pretty severe symptoms. These are things like uh, false beliefs, hallucinations, uh, suicidal thoughts, real, real credible suicidal thoughts that happen in the jail. Um, so these are really, you know, the, the high prevalence of mentally ill people in the, the American jails is uh, noteworthy. And the problem of suicide attempts amongst the mentally ill means that suicide attempts are really pretty common in the jails. So why are there so many mentally ill people in our correctional facilities? Um, it, it has to do with two historical changes in the United States. Um, under President John F. Kennedy, there was a move towards greater civil liberties for mentally ill people that were living in uh, psychiatric hospitals. These were residential hospitals uh, uh, where severely mentally ill people uh, would, be, would be cared for. But there were a lot of human rights violations in the United States in these, and they were gradually defunded, starting with Kennedy and then sort of completed with Ronald Reagan. Now, part of this was because of human rights violations, but, but other things had changed too. Um, uh, over the late 20th century, mid to late 20th century, there was a lot of medical breakthroughs in treating uh, mental illness with medication. Uh, so that's part of why, uh, why the demand for these residential hospitals were falling. And then there was just greater training of medical professionals to do outpatient therapy, like with psychologists, and therapists. So that's one thing, you've got this, this declining uh, population of, of hospitals, and they call that deinstitutionalization, and they're going back into the community. These mentally ill uh, individual, individuals with mental illness are going back into the community, and they're going back into the community at the exact same time that America's prison populations start growing. From the 1970s until the present, uh, our incarceration rates uh, increased fivefold. And as a result of that really large expansion in our prison population, a lot of these emptying uh, hospitals ended up in the prisons and in the jails. And so people with mental illness, uh, they got uh, drawn into that growing prison population. And that was really never part of the American plan to treat mental illness with prisons, uh, but that is what happened. So the mental health court movement um, basically kind of comes with that in mind. Uh, there was this in the light, late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, there just was a growing concern that a lot of mentally ill people were getting stuck in the criminal justice system. They were committing the same offenses over and over. They were ending up in the emergency rooms. They were ending up in the jails. And so these, a couple of um, jurisdictions started studying the problem and decided to set up a, a second kind of court. And uh, that court, was adopted around the country at different points in time. And every county uh, sort of would experiment with the, with the model. And so some would have felonies and some would have only misdemeanors. Some would allow for violent crimes, some wouldn't. Some would dismiss charges, some wouldn't. So there was a lot of variation across counties, which would make it really difficult to study using something like a, a difference in differences just because of the sheer uh, combination of very, very different treatments. So I'm gonna take a different approach. Uh, I'm gonna be working with just one county uh, and using random assignment within that one county into the mental health courts themselves. So what exactly is the mental health court doing? I, I, so what I did for this project is um, I just began making phone calls to the lawyers, uh, the public defender's office, and other the, the uh, people in the sheriff's department in Austin, Texas, which is Travis County. It's about 90 miles from where I live. And I would just take them out for lunch, and I would talk to them on the phone, and 
I just was trying to understand exactly what, men, what does mental health court do from like an, from, from the perspective of a treatment, what exactly is the treatment that you're getting in the mental health courts? And to understand it, you have to compare mental health courts to our traditional courts or what I call the typical courts. In these typical courts, you get, you get arrested, you come to the jail, you're what's called booked. They take all of your information, they uh, put you into the system. They then will screen you for a mental illness. Um, uh, if you're convicted, you go to jail, you're gonna receive medication, treat your mental illness, depending on whether you make bail. But otherwise, you're just being punished by the courts and the judges and the juries, uh, just like any, anyone else would be punished. Mental health courts uh, divert you. They divert you out of the traditional courts and they divert you into these diversion courts. It's complicated. It's a complicated process to get into the mental health courts. It involves lots of different decision making by lots of different parties, uh, but you'll be redirected in the end to a specialty court. If your supervisors believe that the mental illness contributed to the offense, the defendant meets criteria and there's room for you in the, the, the list of offenses, the docket of the court. Now in Texas, we have had problems with suicides in our jails and there was a famous case from 2015, uh, a woman, African-American woman named Sandra Bland was driving to a uh, interview and she was uh, uh, pulled over by a traffic police officer who uh, found her to be, um, uh, have broken a small law, but she argued. And because of the argument and because of her antagonism with the police officer, uh, she was arrested and taken to jail. And three days later, uh, she was found dead. She had committed suicide. The, it was a big controversy in the United States, one of many uh, in which African Americans experienced, uh, uh, you know, a, a death within the criminal justice system, either at the hands of a police officer or in a jail. And it led to the passing of the Sandra Bland Act. And the Sandra Bland Act required that um, judges uh, get information about the, the defendant's mental illness so that decisions can be made, you know, within the first couple of days. But uh, that being said, um, the, these inmates before trial, they still have very high suicide attempt rates. Uh, the suicide attempt rate is eight times higher than in the general population. Uh, they are, uh, about 6% of deaths in the state prisons, and they are the leading cause of death in jails. They account for a third of all the deaths in the jails. And again, the jail is my setting in this project. But the last thing is the social workers. Uh, it, I, when I did a review of the literature, I just relied on a couple of meta analysis studies about suicide and social workers. And it's not well studied and it's not well known what the effect is of a social worker on the suicidality, whether it's suicide attempts uh, or suicide planning or suicidal ideation, it's not clear that they can help because the study, the, the, the question hasn't even really been rigorously studied. Uh, and so we don't really know what they do, if anything. So the reason why I bring up social workers is because in Travis County, you are assigned to a public or a private attorney and the public attorneys um, will uh, receive social workers and the private attorneys won't. So this says right here, there's six private attorneys. I don't know why I have that. I just spoke with Travis the other day and they said they had over a hundred. Uh, but basically what we have is uh, we have two types of attorneys in the mental health court. Okay, so let's say that you've been assigned to the mental health court because your administrators believe that you have a mental illness. The, the therapist will rank the severity of your mental illness. 
And if you have a, on a score of zero to three, if you get a two or a three, you go to the mental health court. But if you get a two, you're going to be represented in the mental health court by a private attorney. And this private attorney has paid $750 for a client. Uh, and the $750 doesn't vary with how many hours they spend on the case. So it's just a flat fee. So it could have some, uh, it could, it could have some perverse incentives, uh, which we think might show up in one of the outcomes if it does. So, uh, there's many lawyers, they do this for extra money. They get some extra training on mental health, uh, but they do not get social workers. If you get a score of a three, and this is for the severely impaired, low functioning, mentally ill person. This is for the moderately mentally ill, low functioning person. This is for the severely mentally ill, low functioning person. And if you get a score of a three, you're assigned to the public defender. Now the public defender is not paid per client. The public defender is paid a salary, regardless of how many hours they work on a client, uh, they always get paid. So they're also not getting extra money at the margin. Um, but there's usually some positive selection uh, that we think is going on with the, the mental health, the, the public defender's office. Well, in Travis County, Texas, it's the, one of the only counties in the state of Texas where they have a public defender's office. Ordinarily, the state of Texas relies on this private attorney system to satisfy the American Constitution. But in Travis County, they have both. They have a public defender's office for the mental health court. They have a private attorney for the mental health court. And that's gonna provide us an experimental setting where we can see what the relative effect is of a public defender on these outcomes when the public defender has access to large numbers of social workers. Should actually be eight. It's, it's two social workers for every one lawyer. Uh, whereas this one is over a hundred lawyers and they have no social workers. And what we're told is that the main difference between these two are they see different groups of people, scores of two, scores of three. So there's selection bias and there's selection bias on the side of the public defender. So the public defender has more social workers or has social workers, private attorneys don't because they're only paid $750. They're not given the funds they need for um, a uh, social worker. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use a uh, randomization based instrumental variable setting to randomize people across these two groups, thus eliminating selection bias. And insofar as the only real salient difference between these two groups of people is that one of them has large social workers and one of them doesn't, we're gonna be able to estimate the returns to having a social worker on mental health outcomes. At least that's the attempt, that's what we're attempting to do. So we're gonna be using data from the Ta Ta Travis County, Texas. This is the uh, county seat of Austin, Texas. Austin is the capital of Texas. So the Travis is the capital effectively of Texas. And this is the county jail. And we have data from four years, 2016 to 2019. We have about 40,000 people uh, in the raw data. It reduces to 31,000 when we use our selection criteria. And then of those 31,000, we have a smaller number. Let's see, let me just look here, how many. We have 4,200 that are given to the private attorney. And we have 928 that are being assigned to the public defender. Okay, so we're gonna be able to measure uh, recidivism because we can tell when a inmate returns to the jail. And we're gonna treat a situation where this unique inmate shows up again at the jail, shows up again at the jail. That's how we're gonna measure repeat offending. But we also have administrative data on the offense type, 
Okay, so we know whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. We know the characteristics of the inmate. We know their mental health scores on a scale of zero to three. We know the kinds of charges they've had. We know if they've committed a suicide attempt or have any kind of planning for a suicide. And the raw data is going to show signs of selection bias. The people that are going to the public defender do appear to be uh, uh, people that are uh, uh, different on observables than those that don't. So we'll look at that in just a second. First thing I want to show, though, uh, is a, um, uh, a graph, uh, a causal graph called a directed acyclic graph. And I want to use it to illustrate one of the challenges of this project. So uh, the directed acyclic graph can uh, help us develop a research design that we can use to uh, try to avoid certain kinds of biases. And there's a, a certain kind of bias that people don't really, uh, in economics at least, often talk about. And it's called a collider bias. And you're, you're reading more and more about that a little more often. Eric Schneider has a paper that was published last year in Explorations of Economic History. And he talked about all the situations in economic history where a collider could uh, create some problems for estimation, all right? And, uh, uh, I'm going to show you that sometimes a collider, which I'll show you what that is, sometimes a collider uh, can even be the type of data that you're working with. So here is an example. Here is an example of what I am studying, what I am studying. So what I've got is uh, a sample of data, all right? And in the sample, I've got an instrument that randomly assigns people to public defenders. The, the instrument is independent of their potential outcomes uh, and their potential treatment status. And I'll get into in a minute. I think it satisfies many, but not all of the IV assumptions. We'll talk about the one that it doesn't. So you're being randomly assigned to a public defender. And um, we're gonna check whether or not being assigned to a public defender makes you more likely to commit another offense. And if you are more likely to commit another offense, you're in our data, you're in a sample of data, because I, uh, I don't observe people not in the data, I only observe people in the jails. So uh, randomly assigned a public defender, maybe it affects recidivism or repeat offending. And once I'm in the repeat offending sample, I can check what it does to suicides. Now, if I have some unobservable that makes a person more likely, more likely to uh, commit another offense and more likely, more or less likely to attempt suicide, then when I am working with a sample just of jail inmates. What it does is it creates what's called a collider bias. And here's the collider bias. So look right here. Look how we go public defenders to recidivism. This is a hypothesized causal effect. But recidivism is caused by some unobservable. And the unobservable also causes the outcome. Now, why is that a problem? Because what Uta Pearl shows is that when you have a sequence of causal effects that goes from Public defender causes recidivism. Recidivism is caused by that unobservable. That unobservable causes suicide. And you only work with the recidivism sample. It's like you've controlled for recidivism. And anytime you have a chain of causal events where two variables collide or they hit at one single variable, that's called a collider and when you control for it, it introduces spurious correlations between the public defender and the outcome, all right? So if there's an effect on recidivism, public defenders on recidivism, I actually cannot evaluate the effect of public defenders on suicide because of this bias that's being introduced because of controlling for R. 
I can always look at the effect of public defenders on recidivism though. And if I don't find an effect on recidivism, then I don't have to worry about this chain. And I can just look at the effect of public defenders on suicide. So what I need is I need public defenders in order to look at the effect of public defenders on suicide. It must be the case that public defenders do not cause recidivism relative to private defense attorneys. If it does, I cannot look at the effect of public defenders on suicide due to this collider bias, but if it doesn't, I can. So let me talk about the instrument. So upon booking, right, that's where you're arrested, you go to jail, they take all your information and they put you into a database. They're gonna take your fingerprints, they're gonna do all of those things. Um, within 36 hours of being at the jail, you will get randomly assigned a therapist. This is either going to be a uh, licensed clinical social worker, a psychologist, or a psychotherapist. You're going to get randomly assigned a therapist, and th that therapist is going to interview you for 15 minutes, all right, 15 minutes long, and they're going to use a survey, and they're going to use their professional judgment. And after they do the survey, and after they think about the meeting, they're gonna give a score of how mentally ill, what's the severity of this mentally ill person's symptoms, okay? So, you know, I want you to think about this as uh, how well do they appear to be functioning given that they're mentally ill? How well do they appear to be functioning? So let's say that you meet, um, someone who doesn't appear to have any functioning related symptoms or they're very mild, then the therapist will score them with a zero or a one and the zero or one just sends you back to the typical courts. Okay, so it's not that they don't have many mental illness, it's that they're not meeting criteria. The um, people with a two means they have moderate symptoms and they're being assigned to a private indigent defense attorney in the mental health court. But if they have very severe symptoms, meaning that they're very low functioning, they're gonna be assigned to the public defender's office. And remember the public defender is the one that is staffed with social workers. After therapists score the inmate, they are assigned to a defender and the therapist never sees them again. Uh, so the therapist has no interactions with the inmate and the inmates don't have interaction with really with the the, well, I guess they can interact with each other, but most of them don't stay long enough. So we think because the inmate uh, never meets with their therapist again, exclusion um, probably holds because there's no way that the randomized therapist can influence future suicide attempts or repeat offending since they never really have any interaction with them either inside the jail or outside the jail. So exclusion arguably may hold trivially. And they're already in the mental health court, so it's really just about being assigned to the type of defender they're gonna get. So what you're gonna do, we're gonna be doing an instrumental variables design and instrumental variables will, um, you, we're gonna be using the leniency design. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be calculating a residualized leave one out mean. What is that? Uh, here's the equation for it, but let me tell you what it is. It's residuals in the sense that we're gonna regress uh, this public defender dummy onto a bunch of controls, including uh, time controls. We're gonna get the residual from that regression. So it's gonna have partialed out all those controls. And then we're gonna use that residual to calculate an average recommendation of public defender by the therapist. So basically it's like if Juan, on average, he recommends public defenders about 50% of the time, but Enrique only recommended it 30% of the time. That's what Z is going to be. Z is going to be the leave one out mean recommendation rate of a therapist. Right? And some people are going to be recommending, as we'll show, recommending public defenders more often. Okay. All right. So what's interesting is, uh, so let's look at the first, the selection bias. I, I, actually, I'm going to skip this because we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to skip to here. 
First thing you can see, this, what this is, is this is the first stage regression of regressing public defender dummies onto all of our controls and a series of public of uh, therapist fixed effects. We have about 50 therapists. And what you can see is there's systematic differences. I mean, it all depends on who you consider to be the base, you know, the, the comparison group. But if this was the comparison group, you've got more and more uh, therapists that will just, or more and more, some therapists are just much more likely to recommend uh, public defenders, even though they're seeing the identical patients. They're seeing the identical inmates because of the randomization, but some of them systematically come to uh, different conclusions. So what you have here is this distribution of this recommendation rate. And you can see right here, even though they're being randomly assigned, uh, even though they're being randomly assigned a uh, defender, uh, sorry, an inmate, if they all made the same decision, there would be no distribution of the propensity of the assignment. There'd be no uh, distribution because they're all making the same decision. But the fact that it varies means that some people have systematic tendencies to, um, to assign to public defenders. So we can show that once we calculate this public defender uh, uh, propensity score, we can look at the, the distribution of inmate characteristics across the score and show that they're very different. So they're very, this, very much the same. So here's a person in the bottom tercile. This would be a person over here. And this is a person in the middle tercile. This would be a person here. And this person's in the top tercile. All right, well, let's just compare them. Well, if you're in the low or the top, the, the share of Asians you see is very similar, right? It's not statistically significant. Uh, the share of African Americans, similar, statistically different, but it's basically a very precisely estimated zero. Race, other. Hispanics, very similar. Male, very similar. Age, very similar. So it looks like they're seeing the same uh, inmates, okay? But now we're going to look at the first stage. So um, when we look at the first stage, okay, we see this very strong relationship between being assigned a strict or a, a very generous um, therapist and the probability of going to the public defender. So if I'm assigned Juan instead of Enrique, let's say Juan recommends public defenders 70% of the time and Enrique recommends them 30% of the time, all right? I'm randomly assigned Juan. I, just by being assigned Juan, compared to Enrique, I'm more likely to go to the public defender regardless of what my symptoms are, all right? And so to go a full one point change in the you know, recommendation rate is associated with a 62% increase in the probability of going to the public defender. So it's a big effect. Basically, that's like saying if you go from this person to this person, basically from the least generous therapist to the most generous therapist. If you go from that person, to that person to 62% increase in the probability of going to the public defender. And it's got a very strong first stage. The first stage F statistic is 128. Uh, when we look at subsamples, when we look at it for males, African-American, Hispanic, young and older, uh, it's always the same sign. There is this big uh, effect that when African Americans are assigned very generous uh, scores, then uh, scores, then they're much more likely to go to um, the public defender. But everybody's the same sign. I'm gonna skip that. All right, so let's look at our results. I only have two more slides, so let's look at our results. We're gonna look here at the two-stage least squares result. Okay, so these first one, two, three, four, five. These are five outcomes. They're all measures of repeat offending. So for instance, this is recidivism. Repeat offending after the current booking. So that would mean I'm assigned to the public defender. Am I more likely to show up again? And you can see there's no statistically significant effect 
of being assigned to the public defender on repeat offending. You're not more likely to repeat offend when you've been assigned the public defender. You're not less likely. Uh, you're not less likely to do it in a first year. You don't commit more in, a, uh, in the future. And you know the days to committing another offense, they don't really change. And there's no real change in whether or not the next um, crime that you commit is a felony. So you know, if you remember back to what I said, here, which was if there was an effect on recidivism, if there was an effect on recidivism, I can't evaluate the effect on suicide because I've got this complicated bias term. But if there is no effect on recidivism, then this is not a bias term and it ends up being fine. Okay, so let's look at the suicide attempt. So I've got three outcomes of interest. I've got whether your mental health score improves. If it improves, that means the next time they went to jail, instead of a three, which is low functioning, they got a two or at least a two, okay? So you can see here that if they were assigned to the public defender, when they showed back up to the jail, they didn't show nearly as uh, uh, severe symptoms. But it's not just that they don't show nearly as severe as symptoms. Uh, they also are 16% to 12% less likely to attempt suicide on their next time in the jail. And they're also less likely to reveal that they're planning a suicide attempt. Most of this reduction in suicide attempt we can detect from the uh, sample of people without a prior offense, there's still a negative effect for people that do have a prior offense, but it's not statistically significant. Um, so to conclude, um, these contemporary debates in America, like police reform, and uh, reforming the uh, courts, oftentimes these, pro these, pro these recommendations are calling for resources in the community to move from police and policing and courts to communities uh, and oftentimes to uh, social services. And you could imagine mental health courts being a candidate, but you could also imagine that um, uh, very little attention might be given to this public defender. Okay, so uh, these contemporary debates are probably going to be pushing resources to go towards things that haven't really been aggressively studied yet. And so what we can say is, um, if you have access to these social workers and you're mentally ill, it appears to improve your mental health. Even if you show back up at jail, you're less likely to commit an uh, to attempt a suicide. Um, uh, public defenders, relatively more impactful, decreasing suicidality. We think that's because of all the social workers. And so counties are gonna need to make two decisions. They're gonna have to decide if they're gonna have a mental health court, but they're also gonna have to make decisions about staffing the, the court with social workers. And so the actual effectiveness of the mental health court might depend on uh, large numbers of resources going to social services. Um, and so that concludes the uh, study. That concludes the study. Um, <clears throat> if you want, to, does anybody have any questions? Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Person asked about the presentation of the video. I will share that later on. Uh, any questions? No raised hand yet. Uh, No, raised hands. 
Yes. No. Oh, yeah, we have one. Sergio, let's go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, sorry, did you study the, the fact that maybe it also has to be with the gravity of the offense? I mean, yeah. there are some people that, okay, you you do a burglary, it's different uh, to commit homicide. Yes. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's a really good comment, Sergio. Okay. So we, we dropped uh, everyone that committed a felony because uh, in Travis County, uh, it's really hard to get precise measurements as to whether or not the court accepted a felony. They don't accept everybody with a felony, but they accept everyone with a misdemeanor. So we focus just on misdemeanors. We don't break it down by the severity of the, the misdemeanor. We just break it down by whether or not they have a prior offense. Okay, thank you. That's a great, that's a great time. Um, I get one from the chat. Uh, are there an the jail for people are sent private or public in Travis County? Um, whether you know, the distinction can be made um, for the rest of the reason. So if there's some sort of private jail or public institution the first time is it uh, are there is there is there enough sample to separate them in, in travel county S separate them how one i didn't catch no. that so the question is in the, the the county jail is private or public and uh, whether or whether there are more than one county jail county place uh, jails in county where they send people and if that could affect uh, recidivism in the future. Mm. We can separate them. So we can separate the data by race, gender, although it's mainly men, uh, it's about 80% men. So we can do it by race, ethnicity, gender, and then any kind of prior uh, prior events that happened before booking. So that would be, are they on medication? Are they, have they ever been hospitalized? The problem is once we start cutting the sample too much, our instrumental variable strategy, our instrumental variable strategy starts to get um, uh, really sparse. Uh, the, the number of observations gets pretty small. So we're already starting with about 5,000 observations, 900 in the treatment group using the randomized therapist. And um, if we use the full sample, we have a strong instrument. We have instruments with an F statistic of 100 and something. But um, once we start looking at it in the subsamples, you can see that it gets weaker. Okay. Um, so we've been a little unsure. I mean, we've, we've looked at some subsample analysis, but we're not really finding a lot. Um, mostly what we find is the effects are pronounced for people that have a um, prior mental illness. That's the main thing that we're finding. I think uh, most of the uh, well, there are no questions yet. If uh, something comes out later, I'll forward the email and the question to you. Um, Scott, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Thank you, Thank you for um, 